Hello, Park Hill. This is Thane Peebles, your wonderful youth pastor. As you gather today, we're just happy that you can gather in some way, shape, or form, whether that be online or in church. We understand during this transition time, people are having to make decisions whether to stay home or come here. We're just happy that you joined. Today, we're gonna play Memory Verse, Remove a Word. With this game, we're gonna read out our memory verse that was for this entire series. And we're gonna keep repeating it, but each time we repeat that memory verse, we're gonna remove a couple words at a time till at the end, there's gonna be nothing left and you have gotta fill out the entire section. Does that sound good, guys? All right, let's go. All right, so here we start. We're gonna start with the full verse this time. It's from Ephesians 3.20 out of the New Living Translation. Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. So here we go to read it again. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Okay, now that we have done the entire verse, now we're gonna go into round one and remove some of the words. Now all glory to God, who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think.
every victory is found in you. It's found in you. All we want, all we need is found in you. Found in you, Jesus. Every victory is found in you. Found in you. It's found in you. to you
Hey, welcome to Park Hill Church. My name is John. I get the privilege of being a pastor here at Park Hill. We're so glad that you've joined with us today, either in person or online. That's right, we are meeting, social distancing together at Park Hill, and we're also gathering together online wherever we may be. I also want to just say a highlight. This Yesterday, we had almost 20 women gathered together for a women's retreat, a Zoom call with women all over the state and actually around the world, literally. And so that was pretty exciting. And so there's more than one way to connect with each other. If you are with us, we'd encourage you to give uh, as you go out. Uh, on the door, by the door over there, there's an offering box. We're not passing the offering plate. And so uh, you can give that way. And also, if you are at home, you can continue to give online or you can give in person as well. Um, I also wanted to highlight and thank you. Uh, because of your faithfulness in giving, we've been able to minister to different needs in our community. Uh, one of those being at St. Vincent de Paul. They made a big cry for help and you responded greatly. Uh, a lot of our food has been going down to Pryor uh, to, to help the church there minister and meet needs, physical needs within their community. And we're going to continue to do this through this crisis and give to this need. So if you have uh, non-perishable food items like uh, uh, jam or peanut butter, oranges, chips, granola bars, uh, things like that that you can drop off at the church. That'd be great. Drop them off and they pick those things up, those items up on Thursday. So thank you so much for your continued giving in that area. Also, you might have a neighbor or someone who is in need through this crisis, or you might have someone that you're praying for, a family member, or maybe it is a neighbor, a co-worker. Uh, we're working on a plan on May 17th to have meal boxes ready for different families. And it's just going to be one meal, and in, with that we're going to combine it with some, with some conversation starters for families. And this is going to be something that we can take ourselves. Uh, we're going to supply it at the church and we'll have it ready that Sunday morning, May 17th. You can pick it up and on the way out and take it to some family that you've been praying for and just say, hey, I've been thinking of you. I've been praying for you. And so be thinking about a family. Be thinking about someone that you have been specifically praying for that you want to reach out to. And we'll have those meal boxes ready May 17th. So your job is to think and pray for that family. Our job will provide for all the things for the box and then you take that box give it to the family and say we love you also uh, we want to give an update we have we hopefully you've received an email from us about possible date nights uh, we know that uh, uh, this crisis has done a number on a lot of marriages in fact it's really bizarre what it's done some uh, the applications for marriage license has actually increased believe it or not but it so has uh, internet search searches for how to divorce your spouse in certain areas of our world. And so we find this dichotomy and we want to resource families and marriages because we believe that marriage is one of the building blocks of our society. And so if we can resource your marriage in any way, uh, that is a great benefit to you. So go to this website, uh, crisis.communio.org, and you will find different um, resources for you, for date nights, for conversation, different things that you can do as a married couple. Uh, if you don't have, if you forgot that already and you get home, you didn't write it down, check out your mailbox because we sent you an email on Wednesday that hopefully you received uh, with some of those links on there. Hey, this morning we have a special treat for you. Preaching this morning is our very own Pastor Ronnie, who gets the privilege of speaking into our kids' lives and our families' lives every single week. And today we get to hear from him. So let's turn, take out our Bibles, let's get ready to go and learn from God's Word and Pastor Ronnie.
Hi, my name is Ronnie, and I'm really glad that you are with us today. I'm the kids pastor, and normally I'm preaching to kids, and uh, preaching to adults is a little bit of a different thing for me. Uh, but I should put out a full disclaimer that I don't plan on doing any kinds of kids ministry shenanigans today. Um, and also, I want to let you know that today is Communion Sunday. This is a Sunday to where we take time to remember what Jesus did on the cross. And we are going to uh, observe communion at the end of our service during response time today. Now, with that said, let's get into the message. Have you ever read any useless or difficult to understand instructions? What about a confusing or misleading sign? Shani and I are working on setting up our girls' first outdoor playhouse. And if you know me, you know that me working with tools is probably a pretty questionable thing. Now, it would have been an utter disaster if it was just left up to me and Shani. I can picture what that would have looked like now. I mean, I could see Shani and I opening up the boxes, looking at all the pieces, and both having panic attacks from everything that we have to do. We would probably be also reading from the wrong language manual as well. Um, but thankfully, we had our in-laws helping us with it. But even with our in-laws' help, and especially my father-in-law's help, um, it's been quite a challenge. We've had to redo some things. We haven't been really sure of what the instructions are actually telling us. Even with the pictures, you would think that if it was pictures, it would be a little bit easier. And it's not. Not at all. And so we've had a lot of frustration. We've had questions. We've had times where we were just straight up confused. And with looking at the step-by-step -step guide, we're left pondering, how in the world do we do this? Now, what's great though, is we are near completion on this project. You know, it's said that information is knowledge, but what are we supposed to do when we're bombarded with information? There's so much info, even about COVID-19, what are we supposed to believe? Whose words are we supposed to live by? Today, in our message, we're going to apply uh, what Peter did in response to Jesus' hard teachings. But before we do that, let's take a moment and pray. Father God, I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you that you love us and that you have good things for our lives. Lord, I know that today's word is going to be a little bit of a harder word for us to chew. Um, and so help us to have ears to hear and a heart that obeys and just fully trust you. Help us to respond to your truth today. We love you. Amen. Hey, you can take out your Bible or open up your Bible app. And I want you to turn to John chapter 6. And we're going to cover verses 60 through 70 today. Now let's check out what it says. On hearing it, Many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. Out, Jesus in this passage calls someone a devil. Now, other transitions 
translations tell us that it's Judas Iscariot. In fact, this passage seems to be a little bit off. So why don't we rewind a little bit and see what led up to this conversation. The book of John is a part of what we call the Gospels or the Good News. These were books that told us about the life and teachings of Jesus. Now, to start with, each of the Gospels had an intended audience that they wanted to write to. John's particular group was the Jewish people right around him. John wanted to highlight the interactions between Jesus' claims and the Jewish people which led to some different situations. Some of these interactions included meeting, Jesus meeting the Pharisee Nicodemus at night to discussing the thought of what does it mean to be born again? Or another situation was Jesus's conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well. Moving forward, John tells us about Jesus's t- attempt to get alone and spend time with his father and how that plan went awry. Or So it seems. Last week in Park Hill Kids Elementary, we talked about how Jesus is compassionate, and, and we specifically talked through the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 people. But what we also discussed a little bit was the fact of why he was out there in the first place. See, Jesus was actually in a lot of pain. Uh, He had just found out that his really great cousin, John the Baptist passed away. He was murdered, unfortunately, and so he was grieving during this time. And so Jesus, thinking that he goes away to spend time with his father, grieving a little bit, that didn't happen at all. Instead, what happened is you had lots of people that followed him out where he was. It was almost kind of like if you were some social media influencer and you were just wanting a break, but everybody was geolocating where you were. And so Jesus didn't turn them away. Instead, he fed them and he ministered to them and he talked to them and he performed this great, amazing miracle out of almost nothing. And then later that night, he tries to go away again. But this time, all of his buddies, his disciples, get on a boat and the storm is going crazy and of which ended up having Jesus actually walking on the water, scaring the living daylight out of all of his friends. It didn't take too long after this where his, all these other people that were around them found out once again where Jesus was and they met up with him once again. But things went a little bit different at this point. See, all these people that were around them they began to hear this teaching from Jesus talking about how he's, he is this, this blood and body that these, these people were going to have to eat and drink. And a lot of people became upset. They started connecting the dots to be exact, that they were realizing that he wasn't just claiming to be a really great teacher who happened to do some pretty awesome things. They were also figuring out that he was claiming to be God. So a lot of people got angry and they left. And this leads us right where we are in our message today. And that caused a lot of friction, but let's see what that looks like. So let's reread a little bit of this. Starting with verse 60, it says this, on hearing this, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching, who can accept it? aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray them. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. Jesus hears their grumbling and complaining, and then he challenges them. And I don't know about you, but anytime somebody challenges me on something, 
I usually don't respond in the best way. I might end up puffing my chest and having a little bit of an attitude and trying to get in their face, which probably isn't the wisest of choices. But did you notice what Jesus said? He told them that the spirit gives life, but the flesh counts for nothing. In this, Jesus makes two statements. One is that the Spirit gives us life, and two, that even the best of our efforts count for nothing. Here's the first thing that I want you to know if you want to live a life infinitely more with Jesus. We must compare ourselves to Christ. Often, our eyes are fixed on other things. They're fixed on the task ahead of us. They're fixed on our dreams and goals. They're fixed on our deepest desires. And they're fixed on what we compare to. In Genesis, we see a people who had their eyes fixed on everything but God. And these people, the people of Babel, wanted to be able to make themselves known out through the entire ancient world. They wanted to be able to create something that would say, God, I'm putting you to the test and say, we're better than you. Now, fortunately, their plans were thwarted and obliviated. They were looking to create wonder and meaning out of their efforts, but they came up short and caused common language to fragment. The people of Babel and even many who left Jesus after his difficult teaching were not willing to look and compare their lives to Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but I definitely fall in this category a lot. Jesus calls us to reflect and view our lives through the lens of his spirit. When we do this, we are seeking the eternal life that he provides and guarantees to those who trust him. Our efforts, even the best and brightest ones, will fail and be worth nothing. That's harsh, but that's Jesus's words. That's not mine. We must know that our kingdoms will fade, but only Jesus's will remain. Now, let's go a little further within scripture. Starting at verse 66, it says this, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Could you imagine what this group must have been feeling during this time? I would have to think that at least a few of them thought, maybe it's time for me to check on out. But Peter doesn't say this. And in fact, in another translation, Peter tells Jesus, where else can I go? Peter knew his options, and his option ultimately was to stay. This leads me to my next thought. We must compare our options. Leaving is often easier than staying. I know that there's been several times in mine and Shani's marriage that I have been tempted after or during a fight to walk out instead of trying to resolve it. The temptation will always seem easier, but the consequences and the pain far outweigh it. If you stay, however, there is a payoff. Being the kids movie nerd that I am, I would like to say it's because I like to do research as a kids pastor, but really it's just because I like kids movies. I, this passage started to make me think about one of the most famous cars in cinema history, Lightning McQueen. And, and specifically in the first movie, see, during, due to his circumstances that were almost entirely his fault, Lightning has to spend time in the abandoned town of Radiator Springs. During this, he tries to deal with the difficulty before him on his own terms leading to greater consequences that affect him and others. Only when he accepts his difficult teachings does he begin to grow as both a car and a, and a being, um, for a lack of a better term. 
Now, putting this back to the Bible, Peter, would, if he would have rejected Jesus' teachings, could you imagine the things that he would have missed out on? And really, we don't even have to imagine. We could just read ahead in the big God story, as I like to call it with our kids. He would have missed out on all of these miracles. And, he would have, and some of these miracles he actually participated in. He would have missed out on preaching on the day of Pentecost and a over, where over 3,000 people came to know Jesus. If he would have missed out and would have said, you know what, it's just time for me to leave, he would have missed out on seeing the birth and the beauty of what God's design for the church was going to be. In difficult times, are you going to leave Jesus? And also, I want you to think about this. Staying is better than leaving. Let me say this again. Staying is better than leaving. Now, I do want to clarify for just a moment. If you're in a situation that is not safe for you or others, exit out. Please go as fast as you possibly can. But in this passage, we're talking about staying with Jesus in hard seasons and difficult instructions. Peter knew his options and realized that Jesus was worth it. Moving on with verses 69 and 70, it says this, We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. As most of us know, Judas goes on to betray Jesus, which leads to Jesus' death and resurrection. Jesus earlier tells them that it's him who himself who enables us to go to him. Later, the Apostle Paul will write that in his letter to the Roman church that God holds us and he will not let go of us. But this leads us with a choice to hold on or not. Living infinitely more will require us to hold tight to Jesus no matter what. When we run to the Father, we are held by Him. When our world is shaking and nothing is normal, we are held by Him. When the things that we once held dear vanish, we are held by Him. So our response must be that we will trust God with the promises that He has for us. Clinging to Jesus requires us to release the things that we hold on to. Today, we've looked at a hard passage that requires us to reflect and ponder what the Spirit is asking in order for us to live infinitely more, just like it did with the disciples. So before we go into a time of communion as our response today, I want us to think through these questions. One, where or what is my effort compared to? Is it me? Is it my work? Is it my desires? Whatever it is, you fill in the blank. Or is it the Jesus that loves us, that sacrificed it all? Am I comparing my life to him? Two, what are my options? Am I willing to stick out for more? Or am I just throwing in the towel? And three, am I holding on to Jesus tightly? Am I willing to let go of what I deem valuable in order to be embraced by the Father? Hey, before we do communion, I just want to go over a couple things to consider. First and foremost, we at Park Hill Church believe that you have to have a relationship with Jesus. This is all about celebrating what he did on the cross. And if you haven't experienced that, then you can't really celebrate, you can't really appreciate what he has done for us. Two, we do what is called open communion. That means anybody who has a relationship with Jesus can be a part of it. It's not just if you're a part of Park Hill Church or our affiliated denomination, the Assemblies of God. Three, kids are totally welcome to observe, but should only participate if they've made the decision to follow Jesus and, to, and they actually understand it. Four, Communion isn't the grape juice and crackers. It's the heart respond 
to remembering what Jesus did to save us. If the only thing that you have is water and goldfish, we're glad that you're taking it with us. And then five, communion is not only personal, it's communal. We need to be right with God and others. If there's a person that you need to forgive or a person that you need to apologize, what I want you to do is I want you to stop whatever you're doing and I need you to go make it right with whoever that person is. With that said, we're gonna go into communion now. Okay, maybe I lied about uh, having no kids specific shenanigans. Today, we're gonna do fruit punch through a juice box as my form of communion. And you use whatever, and I have little saltine crackers right here, get whatever you have and then just, we're gonna take a moment and just remember what Jesus did on the cross for us. And if you have your cracker or whatever you're going to eat, would you just put that in your hand? And would you begin to just close your eyes and think about what it meant for Jesus' body to be broken and to be bruised? For him to take the punishment that we deserved and for him to put it upon himself. Father, I thank you for your broken body. I thank you that you did it so that we could experience wholeness and life with you. God, I pray that the brokenness in our lives, that we would give that to you and that we would know that in return, you're going to give us wholeness. And Father, I just pray that you would help us to trust you with the things that go on in our lives. With that said, would you eat your cracker or whatever item you have with you? Now, take your juice or water or Coke or whatever you have and put that in your hands and begin to ponder about what it was like to see Jesus' blood poured out for us. Jesus, I thank you that your blood was shed so that we would be washed clean, that we would receive grace and that we would receive mercy. And Jesus, I thank you for that precious blood. I thank you that we can run towards you and that we could cling to who you are. We love you. Would you drink whatever you're drinking? Before I let you go, I would love to speak a blessing over you today. And here is your blessing. May God's spirit lead you to do life that is infinitely more. May his power be what you rely on and may his steadfast love hold on to you as you trust him more. Thanks for joining us today and I hope and pray that you have a wonderful week.